Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks for getting up and uh, and being a part of this today. Uh, it's an exciting day. This is a, an incredible event that um, uh, many of us have been uh, working very hard to put together for you, and I and I think it's going to be a, a magnificent morning. Uh, and I can't think of a better way to start it than uh, with having some time with Karen Liu. Uh, I want to uh, first take uh, a moment to. Um, uh, address or, or or guide you over to the the questions area, the Q and A. Uh, there's a note for you there for me to kind of get us started. Uh, I encourage you to ask questions all throughout the session, and we will come back to those as we get to uh, the end of Karen's presentation. Uh, and if we don't get to your questions, uh, we will try to follow up with you after this session and try to give you some good answers. So I strongly encourage you to uh, to interact with us and um, and uh, reach out with any question you have. So I, I, I would all of that's appreciated. Uh, Karen is a senior associate with Snow Krylik. Uh, she is a, a board advisor for NOMA, and she's also a member of our program advisory committee, where she's been an invaluable asset helping us through uh, the selection of new leadership, which we're in the middle of right now, as well as an enormous amount of advocacy toward our BIPOC students through uh, her participation in our NOMAS chapter uh, and, and advocacy for scholarships for our BIPOC students. So she's been a, a crucial asset to us. But I think of most note, uh, about a year ago, Karen started her term as the AI Minnesota president at a time when none of us had any idea about what was about to come. It has been a, an extraordinary year, and it is no exaggeration to, to say that our profession is thriving right now because of Karen's leadership over the past year. Her response to the murder of George Floyd, her response to the pandemic and the effect it's had on our profession, and her ability to keep us focused on climate change through it all has been an extraordinary asset. And we're all very lucky to have her in our community, and we're also very lucky to have her here today. So thank you, Karen, for making your time uh, to be with us today, and I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, John. So even though this is a one sided pr presentation, I'm going to follow some ground rules that are often used in conversations about equity. I'll be speaking from my own experience as an individual and a practicing architect. I'll also begin by sharing some facts about my ad my identity, some of um, which may be apparent and some probably not. Um, my name is Karen Liu. I identify by the pronouns she, her, hers. I'm the only child of immigrants from Taiwan. I was born and raised in central Minnesota. I'm a wife and mother, and I am an architect. So um, take a quick note of this photo, the unintentionally matching outfit um, and the modular stacking toy. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, so my love of architecture is rooted in its breadth and its complexity. And beginning with our education, architects and designers are taught to think critically and to solve problems. We're trained to consider multiple contexts, to understand and envision different points of view, and to relate the overall goal to its many supporting details. Excellence in architecture is not evidenced by any one thing, it's the result of the connections and relationships between many things. Okay, so now I reflect back on my colorful childhood photo and notice the contrast here. Um, this is what happens when you tell our studio of architects and designers that they have a scheduled photo shoot uh, for a national magazine. And this picture always makes my son crack up. <laughs> um, so I have been and continue to be a designer project architect and project manager. Uh, recently, I joined the business development focus group and I'm now helping lead equity work in the studio. At Snow Cryolic Architects, I value collaborating with my colleagues, consultants, contractors, and clients. And I value the strength of a solution that addresses multiple issues and points of view. In my volunteer work with nonprofit organizations, I look for similar opportunities to work with others to further advocate for design excellence in architecture, women in leadership, BIPOC architects and designers, and global citizenship. Over the past several years through this work, I've been engaged in an 
and exposed to many equity initiatives and programs. And this past year, the global pandemic and murder of George Floyd have brought the urgency of equity into the public's daily lives. For most of my life, I wasn't explicitly aware of the concept of equity. Instead, I learned about equity through my firsthand experiences with racism and privilege. Um, here, you'll see the vocabulary that I've learned over the past several, several years. Um, these are the eight most referenced identities, but there are many others, such as family composition, learning styles, political beliefs. Um, diversity is the presence of difference in identity, both visible and not visible. And in itself, it's not positive or negative. Um, and an individual on their own can't be diverse. It requires a collective of individuals to be diverse. Um, inclusion is when there's an environment in which everyone is welcomed, respected, supported, and valued, where all are able to equally contribute to discussions and decision making, and all have the ability to help change systems. Equity is an is acknowledging that advantages and barriers exist and working to identify and eliminate those barriers to provide a level playing field for all. So why is equity important? Uh, why should we prioritize equity? Because it's the right thing to do, because our profession should reflect our clients and our communities, because diverse experiences and points of view improve our projects and increase innovation. Equity may be important to different people for different reasons, and it's important to note here that racial injustice and climate change are deeply intertwined and disproportionately impact people of color. So on to the challenges. Um, as architects and designers, we're trained to consider multiple contexts. Our projects have a local context, an urban or rural site with its unique sun and wind patterns, weather, landscape, neighboring buildings. Our projects also have a broader context. The impact of our work goes far beyond its walls or property lines or neighborhoods. And in the broader context today, we occupy indigenous land and are struggling to make amends. We're meeting in a virtual space, the result of a global pandemic. We live in the city where George Floyd was murdered and the world mourned. We have arguably experienced the warmest year ever recorded and we are facing a deep political divide in our society. Equity is at the heart of so many challenges that we're facing. So now on to the American Institute of Architects. It's a professional organization with over 95,000 members around the world, and it includes licensed architects, individuals who have a professional degree in architecture, such as the Dunwoody, um, Bachelor of Architecture degree, are enrolled in AXP, faculty members, and individuals who work in allied fields. In the spring of last year, there was one strategic priority for the organization, climate action for human and ecological health. Significantly, the changes in our world over the summer resulted in a revised strategic plan in the fall that was approved with two goals, climate action for human and ecological health, and to advance racial, ethnic, and gender diversity. And it was heartening to see the alignment between these priorities and the recognition of Ed Masria, FAIA, and the firm Moody Nolan with the AIA's highest honors. Ed Masria, FAIA, is the 2021 Gold Medal Award recipient. He's recognized for sounding the alarm on climate change and motivating the profession to take action. And some of you may have seen him um, at the keynote at the AIA Minnesota Virtual Conference uh, in October. He is not the typical recipient known for an identifiable style or body of built work, but rather his impact on the industry. And Moody Nolan is the 2021 architecture firm recipient. Uh, they are the nation's largest African-American owned firm and they are recognized for embracing talent that hails from diverse cultures, races, and socioeconomic backgrounds. And they operate at the critical junction of architecture and citizenship, demonstrating that responsible design requires a marriage of art, function, and community. 
Um, the next um, point is the AIA Code of Ethics, and it guides members in upholding the highest standards of professionalism. Back in 2018, rules were adopted that address sustainability and equity. And the rules not only prohibit harassment or discrimination based on identity, but also state that members should provide their employees with a fair and equitable working environment. In December 2020, a rule was adopted that prohibits the design of spaces intended for execution, torture, or prolonged solitary confinement. Now, some of this or all of this may seem obvious to many, but it is acknowledging the accountability of architects and its significant progress. And now on to the framework for design excellence. And some of you may be familiar with this. Um, it was originally developed to evaluate sustainable design. And there are 10 measures identified that result now in a holistic view of design excellence. It was adopted um, as the standard for design excellence uh, and not sustainability specifically. Um, equitable communities is one of these measures and many of the other measures address climate action. A 2020 was the first year that the AI Minnesota Honor Award submissions were evaluated, evaluated using the AI framework for design excellence. Uh, previously, awards were more subjective and primarily recognized function, innovation, and aesthetics. Um, AM Minnesota is currently in the process of conducting an overall awards review, particularly through the lens of equity and inclusion. And the assessment encompasses evaluating each award, its intended goal and recipients, awards criteria, jury composition, and alignment with AI Minnesota and AI national priorities and values. And Moving on to the AI Minnesota Culture Change Initiative. For the last couple of years, AI Minnesota has been working on the Culture Change Initiative, which focuses on accelerating change in the profession of architecture, from the current culture to a desired culture that's authentic, equitable, and collaborative. And one way to do this is by changing mindsets. And here, I'll just give you two examples. Um, one, say from the mindset that long hours show dedication and self-sacrifice that they're a badge of honor to the mindset that long hours are unhealthy and not necessary to create high quality work. Um, if any of you have ever seen Julie Snow speak, she talks a lot about the 40 hour work week. Um, and that that is something that we strive for in our office. So people have time to engage in um, volunteer opportunities or be with their families. Um, the second mindset is that architects who lead the design functions in firms are the real architects and that they're more valuable to the work of architecture and should be deferred to. Um, changing it to a, a mindset that accelerates the culture of uh, the cu desired culture that, the, that we want, which is authentic, equitable, and collaborative is to say that all architects, designers, and members of the architecture community are deeply valuable to the work of architecture. And so with the profession, uh, the good news is that even though we have a long way to go, there's a lot of impactful work right now advancing equity in architecture. And so now um, I will talk about a few projects. Second and second is a multifamily development in the North Loop neighborhood of Minneapolis. Um, the site is located within the 19th century area of the Minneapolis Warehouse District and the St. Anthony Falls Historic District. It's a modern building that is seamlessly woven into the fabric of the surrounding neighborhood. And unlike many other recent local multifamily developments, this project has an outdoor landscaped courtyard. The space is open to the public, accessible to pedestrians only, and designed to create a sense of place for the community and a space for all to enjoy. And this is the entrance to the courtyard from the street. A reflective metal ceiling and lighting further activate the pedestrian portal. This is great. This is a view of the courtyard from above. I think it's from our latest toy 
our drone. This project received a 2020 AI Minnesota Honor Award and was lauded in the categories of design for integration and design for economy. Although the project wasn't recognized for design for equitable communities, it achieves the measure's intent to contribute to an accessible, walkable, human-scaled community and to include, engage, and promote human connection. The next project is Salt City Market. It's a mixed-use development located at the edge of downtown Syracuse, New York. And equity was embedded in this project from the beginning. The client is a nonprofit foundation, and their mission for the project is to connect diverse cultures and people in a welcoming, inclusive gathering space that promotes collaboration, economic opportunity, and a deep sense of community. The massing and exterior of the building reflect the three distinct programs. The street level is a glassy public food hall that serves as an incubator for local businesses. The second level is office space for the clients and other nonprofit organizations that share its community facing mission. And the third and fourth levels are dedicated to mixed income housing where rent is dependent on annual income. The market is located at the corner of South Salina and West Onondaga Streets, an intersection that's heavily trafficked by vehicles and people coming from the nearby convention center, transit hub, and hotels. An exterior patio between the market and the neighboring building accommodates dining, playing, and gathering, while the parking lot behind flexibly accommodates food trucks and larger community events. The construction photo here shows the massing of the first level as it follows the street edge and the upper levels are rotated to open to views and neighborhoods to the south and west. Um, what's great is in alignment with the mission, the construction manager also employed labor from targeted neighborhoods with a minimum of 30% people of color working on the project. They just this past Friday had its official ribbon cutting ceremony and I was able to attend by Zoom. Okay, this next project is St. Louis City SC. SC stands for Soccer Club. It's a major league soccer stadium and the first MLS club that's majority owned by women. The ownership group engaged many women and minority owned businesses in all phases of the project from design or from management to design and construction. Uh, the project goals include spaces that are iconic and inclusive and anchor a mixed use district with the intent to activate the urban neighborhood 365 days a year. Um, the ownership was impressed with Snow Krylix Urban CHS Field in St. Paul, which acts as an extension of the city. And the stadium is located diagonally. Can you see my mouse here? My arrow or not? Um, is located diagonally across from the historic Union Station at the western end of Gateway Mall, a series of linear public green spaces that terminate at the Gateway Arch and Mississippi River to the east. Sorry, the image is like flipped from what you'd expect, west to east. Uh, this is Mill Creek Valley, a vibrant community of 20,000 people. 95% of whom were African-American, once occupied the stadium site. And in the 1950s, uh, so-called urban renewal efforts uh, resulted in the demolition of the entire neighborhood to make room for new expressways, further dividing North and South, south St. Louis, um, similar to what happened to our, our local Rondo neighborhood here in St. Paul. So now expressway ramps are being reworked to minimize their impact on the urban fabric and to make room for new development. The public green space of the mall is extended onto the stadium site to the south where there'll be a memorial to Mill Creek Valley and to the east where the trajectory turns to provide stronger connections to disadvantaged neighborhoods to the north. And it was important to us to have the stadium connect to the city in every direction and to not have a back door. Uh, services instead access the stadium level at, at the pitch, level of the pitch south of the, sorry, through a tunnel to the south. Um, their primary entrance is at each corner and views to and from the city from all sides. 
And here's the rendering that was issued, released to the public, I think in December. Um, the main entry steps in East Plaza parallel a new north-south bike and pedestrian greenway that you can see here in light green. Both spaces serve to host public gatherings, pre-game activities on game days, and music and food festivals, yoga, pickup soccer, dog walking, and patio dining on non-game days. Concessions play an important role in the stadium, and the vendors for the stadium will be selected to reflect the diverse immigrant communities of St. Louis. And these concession and restroom, we used to call them chiclets, but these little boxes along the East Plaza are designed to serve both interior and exterior events. And many of the condition spaces spaces in the stadium are also intended to be used year round for public and private events. So we considered corporate functions, weddings, um, you know, Christmas parties, things like that. And the Ferris wheel is actually there. We didn't just put it in for the entourage. <laughs> um, the overall soccer re related development includes a training facility, practice fields, and a pavilion seen here on the left, which houses the team store. And here's a view from the pitch. Um, we're collaborating with HOK on the stadium. In the beginning of March last year, we had several team members that were spending multiple days each week working in HOK St. Louis office until the week of March 16th, when the global pandemic required us all to start working from home. So less than two months later, on May 25th, George Floyd was murdered in Minneapolis. Like many others, Snow Krylik wrote a Black Lives Matter statement. What was significant to me was that it was a collective effort written with input from all of our studio members. We committed to fighting for justice, and among the many actions we took, we formed an equity and inclusion group to hold ourselves accountable. So what does this mean to our practice? As a studio, we developed equity and inclusion goals with the overarching objective to be intentionally inclusive citizen architects. Advocacy and responsibility are implicit in that statement and supported by three goals that focus on ourselves, our studio, and our work. We have engaged in equity training to help ourselves learn to bridge across difference, and we're bringing the related agendas of equity and sustainability to all of our projects. Even though our studio members are all at different places in equity work as individuals, this is the beginning of our equity work together. So um, I just have one last thing I want to mention is please subscribe to ENTER at entermn.com. Uh, it's a digital weekly publication of AI Minnesota that just debuted last week. And the feature article is about Longfellow Rising, a collective of business owners next to the third precinct precinct who have a vision of a just and sustainable future. And there's also a great piece called Preserving the Spirit of Democracy in the Time of Barricades by Mary Margaret Zindrin, the Executive VP of AI Minnesota. And my favorite phrase from that article is, or quote, is we designed our way here, which means we can design a better way forward. The we of who designs that way forward is key. It must be a we that is truly representative of the people. So thank you, John, for inviting me and thank you all for having me. I'm honored to be speaking with you today. And as I address the AI Minnesotas at the end of AI Minnesota members at the a end of 2020, um, I look forward to working with you all towards a more authentic, equitable and collaborative profession and a better built environment for all. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much for your thoughts and the time. It was uh, it was it's very powerful um, to see the ethic behind the work, which is I know so often um, can so often be um, um, missed if we just are looking at pictures on Instagram. And to see that the the hard ethic behind it and the the values that that are shared behind it, it's just a really powerful uh, powerful thing to see. Um, seeing no questions yet, I'm going to ask one. Uh, as I, I'm seeing nothing published yet, I know you've I know you've all got some brewing around in your head, but um, I, I have a um, 
uh, one of the things that I think, uh, you know, that maybe is in some of the minds of some of the students um, and, you know, is you, you, the work that you do is also visually very beautiful and it, it, you know, there's a great attention to detail and scale and materiality uh, and form and, um, uh, you know, and proportion, all of these sort of design fundamentals which on the surface might seem very divorced from the ideals of social justice and climate change. Um, but, uh, you know, as we all know, these are integral acts. And uh, I'm curious from your perspective and in your process, how those connect for you, how the, uh, the material and the, the detail, kind of the work of the, you know, uh, work of the building um, ties back to some of those, uh, some of those ideals. I don't know the exact quote that that we use on our website, but um, I think we're we're known for a lot of work that is is ordinary, considered ordinary ordinary transit stations, um, what used to be bordered stations, and try to elevate the experience for everybody um, by bringing uh, great care and attention to detail to these projects. Um, those aren't glamorous projects, um, but they're about making something of something that's typically overlooked or making it just as important as a museum or, you know, institutional building. Yeah, it's, it seems to me that there's sort of an under, there's a, there's a level of care and caring seems to be uh, such a powerful thing in your work. And I, I, that's something I've always uh, really appreciated is that there's the, there's a care in the, in the core and the heart of it as a, um, in how it impacts all of us as people, how it improves our human sustainability. Uh, but then there's in that care comes through right down to the details. So I just always appreciate the way that you um, approach your work in that integral kind of way. I, I really like the way you said that, John. I really think when I think about equity, um, I was in a conversation the other day and fundamentally, you know, can be boiled down to respect, you know, respect for individuals and their and their differences. Um, and so when you talk about care, to me, that those are very similar um, concepts. Yeah, and I've always, you know, felt like, you know, um, the, we deserve, the, we, you know, it, it is just for us to give our very best for those who need it most. And I feel like, you know, sometimes it's easy to give a little bit less than our best when we're working in contexts that may not expect it of us. But it, I think that's another thing that, like you said about your work, that it comes from these sort of ordinary building programs where no one expects you to excel, you know, to, to put that level of care into the design. Uh, but I believe that there's a, a great deal of human dignity when, when you do that. So I just really appreciate it. I've always had a, a great admiration for it. So I appreciate you sharing it. Thank you. Okay, last chance, anybody. This is your chance. <laughs> Um, you can follow up with me as well, you, and I and I will, you know, I promise to uh, forward it on to Karen and and connect you. Um, I encourage you to get involved with Nomas, our Nomas chapter with Noma, um, and um, and you know, get involved with the AIA as as Karen said. Subscribe to uh, to enter. It's a it's a great it's a great new era for us as uh, as an organization for how we uh, plan to communicate. So I'm excited about it all. So we've hit our time, um, and uh, again, I just want to say a huge thank you, Karen, for taking your time to be with us today um, and to share yourself, you know, you as your as a person, um, for for being willing to do that for us uh, and. Um, I hope that we all get to see you on reviews in the in the near future and um, that we get to continue no. to connect. Yeah, definitely. Happy to be here. Thank have you. Have a great day, everybody. Yes. Thank you all for being here.